Yeah, I grew up in Clearwater and graduated from Clearwater High School, went on uh, my first year or so of college was at St. Pete Junior College at the time, uh, which is now St. Petersburg College, and they had this amazing aviation administration program where you could earn your private pilot's license as part of the program. and. You know, and then I went on to study uh, aeronautical engineering at Embry-Riddle over in Daytona Beach. So stayed in Florida, you know, as long as I could and ended up working for about 10 years at the Kennedy Space Center as an engineer, a uh, NASA engineer on the space shuttle program. And I think it was while I was there, really, and, uh, you know, I think about myself, maybe I'm a little slow, you know, probably nine into the 10 years being there started looking at astronauts and considering the job they have and realizing that, I don't know, 99.9% .9 of what they do is not flying in space. It's down here on Earth. And at least 80% of it was a lot like what I was already doing as a NASA engineer. And I think that one thing was, that realization was what made me think, well, maybe I can pick up the pen and fill out the application myself, that I could consider, even consider that job as a possibility. Because up until then, I thought that astronaut was one of those jobs that, oh, you know, other special people get to do that job. Why should I ever think that I could do it? And I think the little nudge of some people that I consider to be mentors, doing nothing more than encouraging me to pick up the pen and fill out the application, uh, took me down that path and, and very thankful. And growing up in Clearwater, you know, Clearwater is a special place. Uh, this whole Tampa Bay area is, uh, you know, we're standing here at Mosey now with this celebration of Apollo going on. And it's kind of like going to the moon and coming back to Earth and rediscovering that. For me, you know, I went off for 20 years to Houston, flew in space, and then coming back to Clearwater and St. Pete and Tampa. I am in awe of how this place has developed, transformed into just a really wonderful mix of science and art and food and beer and the beautiful beaches and all that surround it. My mentors, a couple people that I uh, worked with at Kennedy Space Center, um, Jay Honeycutt is one of them, Tip Talone is another, who when I talked to them about this, they just really in the simplest way, they, they didn't say, oh, Nicole, you'd make the greatest astronaut you know, there ever was. They just told me to pick up the pen, which you had to do back then, it wasn't a computer thing, um, to pick up the pen and fill out the application. And I had worked closely enough with them at my time at the Kennedy Space Center that I think they, you know, they saw enough in me to, to encourage me. Um, but I don't think also that they're the kind of kind of guys that would try to discourage you either. And I think that's the kind of people we need in our lives. We need people that are always lifting us up, helping us you know, find the best in ourselves. And I'm really thankful that they did that for me. I was working at the Kennedy Space Center you know, about 10 years on the shuttle program. And then at the end, the space station program was we were starting to build up the hardware and think about getting it up to space. And uh, when I was selected uh, to be an astronaut, that was the second time around of applying. I didn't get picked the first time. Uh, and when I didn't get picked, they, NASA offered me this job at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. And I, I, thought, I, had, I thought I had like gotten the biggest prize because I was asked to come work and fly on airplanes and train astronauts how to land the space shuttle. And for a person whose inspiration was all about wanting to know how things fly, uh, and that goes back to Clearwater Air Park with my dad and my family flying small airplanes, I thought I really had thought I had hit the jackpot. Didn't get picked to be an astronaut, but oh my gosh, I get to fly these airplanes that are like diving towards the ground and training astronauts how to land the shuttle. And I did that for two years, and then I got selected to be an astronaut. And like I said before, astronaut is, you know, like that less than 1% is the time you spend in space. I was in the astronaut office for 15 years, and I flew in space for 104 days. So that kind of tells you. And uh, the job we do is all about supporting the crews who are in space 
We're training to learn all of the things that we need to know to fly in space. Uh, we're working on some of these future programs. Uh, how are we going to go back to the moon? How are we going to go to Mars? How are we going to stay and live safely on the International Space Station? And very fortunate to have had a really wonderful almost 30 year career with NASA. So 104 days in space and that was spread across two missions. And my first was at the end of 2009. I flew up uh, with a crew on the Space Shuttle Discovery and they dropped me off. And then I lived and worked with the space station crew for a little over three months and then came home on the Space Shuttle Atlantis which, oh, by the way, if you haven't seen it, you can go across the state to Kennedy Space Center and see it on display. And then about a year and a half later, I flew again to the station, but only for two weeks uh, on the final flight of the Space Shuttle Discovery. I don't know that I would have known I was suited to do it. Uh, I, and I've also had the opportunity since being selected and, and flying and working as a NASA astronaut, I've had the opportunity to sit on the other side of the table to help select you know, new classes. And I think one of the things that I've really noticed in kind of the characteristics maybe in the character perhaps of the people that we end up selecting now is that one, they're gonna be people that you, know, you wanna be able to have a conversation with. You know, if you're locked up in a small, relatively small place for months at a time and you know, working together, you want to be able to get along with each other. You want the diversity of it, you want the kind of different mix of interesting backgrounds to come to come out and and to know that when it hits the fan you'll be able to you know count on these people that they know you'll have their back too but you also want the personality of of these people you want to know you'll have a good time and enjoy yourself there as well with them uh, and I think that comes from just a wide mix of, of backgrounds in my class alone uh, we have 17 different people. Not one of us got to that place the same way. All of us at some point decided, well, I think you know, I'll pursue this astronaut thing. I'll at least apply. But every one of us had a different educational kind of background. You know, we have a mix of oceanographers and geophysicists, aeronautical engineers, test pilots, medical doctors, you know, this whole biologist, this whole gamut of science and engineering and tech. But then I think even more interestingly, we have artists and race car drivers and near professional water skiers and chefs and house builders and rock climbers and people who rebuild cars. I mean, all of these kinds of things where it's not just somebody that's so buried in the books and what they're studying, they're looking beyond that to how they use that to change and improve you know, the world around them but then also how do they use it to enjoy life as well. This is the International Space Station um, program patch. And so, and I love it because I think in one little picture here, it represents this amazing example that we have that's been circling our Earth for the last 20 years of how we should be living together as crew here on Spaceship Earth. So, complex machine that we've built in space with 15 other countries somehow peacefully successfully living in space together and then tens of thousands of people down on the ground doing what we need to do to keep the program going peacefully successfully together uh, probably the most complex thing we've ever built as human beings and it's in space i mean that's pretty cool and we did it in a way to mimic as best possible what our planet does for us naturally you know, we built it so humans could survive there. And that thin little metal hull of the spaceship, you could think about that like our thin blue line of atmosphere. And every day we are acutely aware of how much CO2 is in our air. Do we have enough clean drinking water? You know, does everybody have enough food? I mean, all of those kinds of things to keep your crew healthy and able to survive so you can do the science and all the stuff that's up there. That's the International Space Station patch. Every one of these blue flight jackets, which is the kind of jacket we use to fly in the T-38 jets, we also take them with us uh, on the space station. Uh, and every mission has a mission patch that the crew gets to help design. And you'll have your names of all your crew members on it. And when we were originally signed to STS-133, we were assigned as the final space shuttle mission. 
And then later, uh, 134 came along, and then 135, very thankfully, we were able to add on these other flights. But we wanted our patch to represent that, um, kind of this memory of the whole program, and we wanted to do it in a way that wasn't, you know, like Alpha Omega, the beginning, the end kind of thing. We wanted it to be really artistic, and so we called um, a really wonderful space artist, Robert McCall. This is very much his kind of style, the beautiful colors, the stylized um, space shuttle, and I think it's absolutely one of the most beautiful mission patches ever. And of course, US flag. Um, for the other countries, everybody will have their own flag on the suit, um, my name badge. And uh, in the military, you know, pilots have their wings. Um, for the astronaut office, we do the same, and we have a very special astronaut symbol in the center of the wings, and um, so that's kind of cool. Uh, 100 days, because uh, I spent over 100 days uh, on the space station, and then Mach 25, which is kind of fun. When we land, we exceed you know 25 times the speed of sound, and we all everybody looks for it on the little Mach meter, and so you get this little patch that tells you how fast you got to go. <laughs>